nonsense. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Public Works Finance Committee meeting. It is November 8th, 2021. I am joined by Councilors Gina Teruccio and Art Bedke. Actually, it's the 22nd. It's the 22nd. I'm sorry. I got that quite wrong. <laughs> it's November 22nd. <coughs> and that brings us to our first item of the day, which is approval of Public Works <coughs> Finance Committee meeting minutes from November 8th. Look good to me. Same. Same for me. Great. All right, so item number two, lot line adjustment 2015 and 2021 Crestwood Drive with Amy Henrick. All right, good afternoon. Hello. Hi, Amy. How are you all? Um, so today's lot line adjustment is pretty straightforward. Um, as uh, Ms. Zabala mentioned, it's for 2015 and 2021 Crest Crestby Drive. Uh, these are the subject properties just uh, south of Crestview, east of Mountain View. Uh, the the uh, subject properties, 20, 2015 Crestwood Drive is just over 10,500 square feet. Uh, 2021 is just over 13,000 square feet. The applicant is proposing to shift that common lot line uh, just four feet to the west. And as a result of that would uh, decrease 2015 Crestwood to just under 10,000 square feet and 2021 just over 13,500 feet. Um, this is a survey that was completed showing that four foot adjustment along that common lot line. And this is what the lots would look like as a result. These lots are zoned R2 and in the R2 zoning designation, lots are required to have a 30 or 60 foot width, minimum square footage of 7,000 square feet. Uh, both of these lots will meet those requirements after the lot line adjustment if approved. So it is staff's recommendation today that uh, we approve the lot line adjustment with no conditions. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Any questions for Amy? Um, just to double check, but I saw in the packet that uh, part of this is for side setback reasons because one of the foundations is already there. Correct. It would seem to save a lot of money to adjust the lot line instead of dig up a foundation. So I don't have a problem with this. Yeah, me neither. Makes It makes good sense. I agree. And I'm thinking consent for that. Yes, ma'am. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, so item number three, resolution opting into the opioid litigation with Gary Reedner and Mia Batista. I don't ever give PowerPoint presentations, so I'm not quite sure how to exit out of this. Thank you. You can sit down, I'll get you up. Thank you. <laughs> I try to keep my presentations as minimal as possible. <laughs> Thank you. If you recall, um, this opioid litigation has been in place for several years now. I think it was over a year ago where the city of Moscow was contacted by a law firm who was one of the firms who were pursuing litigation against Johnson & Johnson and several other companies. Um, and we had talked about whether it made sense at that point in time for the city of Moscow to sign on, to hire counsel and to sign on at that point in time. At that point, we knew that Laytaw County had already filed suit and we were included as part of that. And we knew we would be, you know, a recipient for any settlements that would come from that. We also believed at the time that the state of Idaho at some point would opt in to this litigation. And so if you, you may have received a letter on September 13th from Attorney General Lawrence Wasden, where he informs the mayor and council that he and Governor Little announced that the state of Idaho was going to participate in the national opioid settlement with Johnson & Johnson and then the three major opioid distributors, distributors. And then he was writing to ask us as a city to join in participating in this, in this settlement agreement. And so as part of this, the Attorney General's office has this website that's completely dedicated to the opioid litigation. Uh, the link to that was included in, in the information provided in the agenda, the link to that. Just one of the forms, one of the um, settlement agreements and information is like 589 pages. We opted not to include that in your 
packet because that's why we gave you the link. Um, and there's just there's just volumes and volumes of information. So part of that is they provided this PowerPoint presentation for me to share with council to help kind of give an overview of what it looks like to opt in and the impacts if we do not choose to opt in. And so just some general background information, the addiction and overdose um, is considered an epidemic in Idaho. And actually the CDC has considered this a national epidemic. Um, this chart gives you the opioid deaths in Idaho uh, from 1999 to 2017. And actually I, I did reach out to Lata County to receive information that they included in, in their filing. And they shared with me that in 2018, so from January 1 to July 18 of 2018, our county had six opioid related overdose deaths. 2017, our county had seven. 2016, our county had two. 2015, we had three. And 2014, we had three. And, um, you know, the specifics, if you want to know the specifics of the type of drugs involved, it was fentanyl, methamphetamine, amphetamine, morphine, alprazolam, oxycodone, um, and the list goes on. So there's quite a variety. So Idaho is participating in two nationwide settlements. Um, they would resolve all the legal claims related to the opioid epidemic with Johnson & Johnson and the, th the three major pharmaceutical distributors that are on the right. The state of Idaho, through the governor and attorney general, signed on to these settlements on August 20, 2021. Because the state is participating, there are several local governments and municipalities, including municipalities that are eligible to opt in. And the more people that opt in, the more eligible governments that opt in, the larger the claim. And so I'll, I'll try to explain that as we go through this PowerPoint. I think this is very helpful. So the total funds available, so if all the local um, agencies, all the local governments, counties, municipalities, health districts, um, school districts that are eligible, if everybody opts in, then we're looking at a maximum 120 million for the state of Idaho. And as you look at it, so that, that's where the base is. So guaranteed 64 million in base payments. They need the participation from local governments for the additional 56 million in incentive payments. And so they are encouraging all of us local governments who qualify to opt in. And then it provides a payment timeline. This breaks it down even more. This to me is a little more confusing. It provides the same information that was on the previous slide, but it just kind of breaks it down as to who are participating agencies. So all counties, cities that are greater than 10,000 or have filed separate um, lawsuits, school districts that are over 25,000 enrolled, fire districts that have over 25,000 population and hospital districts that have over 125 beds. And then the same with the distributors. So this really is just providing the same information in the chart before, it just puts it in a different format. So here is the uh, allocation of funds between the state and local governments, and there's three options. So if there are not enough participating agencies, local governments who opt in, then the default settlement is what you see in the green which would be the minimum um, of the 56 million that would then be dispersed based on a calculation, um, which would be the least amount, of course. The state of Idaho is proposing this allocation agreement where 40% goes to the state, 40% goes to participating counties and cities, and 20% to the regional health districts. In order to be able to use the second option, they need 60% of the population of eligible counties and cities to sign on for the agreement to be effective. And the deadline to opt in, I believe is January 2nd, there is a sign, uh, but we wanted to get through this process so that um, if you wanted additional information, we can come back with additional information. And then the third, the allocation statute, Idaho, they say Idaho can, legislator can pass a statute specifying how all or some of the funds are allocated. But at this point in time, the attorney general's office is not pursuing legislation at this time. Um, they've reached an agreement with the participating local governments that provide for the, the allocation.
All right, and so injunctive relief. So um, part of this agreement, the settlement agreement provides for injunctive relief, including providing funds for abatement. So the injunctive relief are, there will be major changes in how the prescriptions will be distributed and sold. It increases accountability and oversight. Um, there would be a national database funded by the defendant distributors to help stop deliveries of opioids to pharmacies where diversion and misuse are occurring. And then Johnson & Johnson will be prohibited from selling or promoting opioids. And then this goes through who is eligible to participate, where we already went over that on one of the previous slides. How can an eligible local government participate? So that's part of the reason why we're here today. So um, we do need to pass a resolution. If, if council decides that this is what we want to do, we do have to pass a resolution at an open meeting, agreeing to participate and giving um, me authorization to sign the forms and then to sign the forms and submit those according to um, the legal documents. So um, yes, January 2nd. So that's um, our deadline for our participation deadline. And again, if you uh, want any ad additional information, you can visit that website. I know I went through that quickly. I think the information that was included in the packet is pretty um, lengthy. And I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you may have. Well, no questions here, but uh, personally, I think we should join in with this because clearly Moscow and Latak County are being impacted by the opioid issue, same as everybody else is. And uh, I think we should jump in. Do we have any idea of how we would apply the funds or are there rules about where the funds can go? There are definite rules about where the funds can go. So the funds um, that we receive, we, they, we would have to use them for abatement purposes, which would include putting money towards treatment, education, um, counseling. And there's actually a long list of things that we can use the money for. If you look at page 14 of 31 on Exhibit A, it provide, it's a beginning of a long list of approved abatement strategies uh, where the money can be utilized. And this would be similar to any type grant funding where we would have to keep track of what we're using the money for. And I, they may have even more specific requirements for the, utilizing those funds and what we have to pro provide in support of that and things like that. But um, yeah, it, it's quite expansive. Uh, what we can use that, those funds for. So something like recovery center is included in that. Yes. And even crisis center. Yes. If you, if I can, I have a question, um, Madam Chair. Oh yes, please. <laughs> um, please Gina. The the so so art statement about the recovery center and the crisis center. That money is all funneled through the city, correct? Yes. Okay. I, I guess I am in complete agreement with Art in that we should definitely be part of this. I think any any kind of abatement programs or or yeah, I think it's important that we do. I agree, and it's pretty clear. If we, I mean, if we don't participate, then we're not eligible. And so, my, I had some questions that were answered during your presentation as well. There's one that I'm curious if if either of you know. It says that health districts are eligible. Do we know if our district would apply, and then would we be beneficiaries of that funding potentially within the district? The health district itself is eligible. And if they choose to opt in, they would receive a certain percentage. I think there was um, that information, and I don't know if it's in the packet itself or if it was on another. It's in one of the tables. Okay. It's in there. Yeah. And so they would receive a certain percentage if they opt in. The city itself too, if the city did not want to be responsible for deciding how to disperse the funds that we received, we could opt to transfer our the money that we would be allocated to the health district and let the health district determine what mm -hmm. to do with those funds if we as a city didn't want to make that decision. Great, that's helpful. I was thinking, yeah, just trying to picture holistically what might be available in the community of say fire districts or mm -hmm. anyone else might be eligible. But I think those were all my questions. Did anybody have anything else? Mm -hmm. No, so regular agenda for this. And mm -hmm. thank you very much. You. Yeah. All right, item number four, sewer general facilities charge implementation with Tyler Palmer. Thank you. 
Bit. Hello. All right. Good afternoon. All right. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon um, to talk a little bit about the sewer general facility charge. Um, as the council may recall, we recently last year we went through a water sewer rate study um, and went through the process. Those 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 um, studies assure that our that the rates that we're charging for the service within our enterprise funds align with the costs of providing said services. Um, and through that process, we take a look at our general facilities charges. There was some recent case law in Northern Idaho um, where uh, there was a municipality that was charging general, uh, general facilities charges based on a certain equation. The court took a look at that and actually established an equation and established some guidelines by which general facilities charges needed to be looked at. So as the city worked through this last through, the, through this last rate study process with our consultant, we took a look at how that lined up with how we were charging general facilities charges um, and applied the formula that the court had generated to our general facility charges. The good news was that it indicated that we were actually charging less than what the court formula allowed within the general facilities charges. So we certainly weren't overcharging for those. But it gave us an opportunity to take a look at the general facilities charges, the way that we charge them, and take a look at bringing that into alignment with the case law. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, in the in the fee schedule that was sent in, we sent in um, a rate based on um, an equivalent residential unit. Now, you all have become intimately familiar with equivalent residential units as we've worked through the storm water utility. Um, and so as we worked through the general facilities charges, um, that's really, it's really the same kind of structure. In a lot of ways, it makes it far more clear and easy to understand. So previously, when the city, when the city built out for a sewer general facility charge, there were a series of different categories. So if you were a trailer home, if you were an apartment, if you were a business, if you were a single family residence, and then it allowed a certain number of what are called PFUs or plumbing fixture units. Those were equivalent plumbing fixture units, and those numbers are established within the plumbing code. So for example, a, a washing machine, I think, is two plumbing fixture units. And so it tries to calculate the capacity needed within a system to accommodate that sort of appliance or that sort of plumbing fixture. And when we look at general facility charges, that's really what we're looking at is capacity in the system. Because when we build out the sewer system, we have to have the capacity to handle the flow from whatever is built within that system. And so we have to have the peak capacity that can handle the peak flows so that if everybody decided to take a shower at the exact same time that we could, that our pipes could handle it and it could make it to the water reclamation facility. Um, and so through that process, we took, we took a look at, at uh, our flows and the flows were established. Um, and, uh, and then we were able to compare that to the plumbing fixture units and we were able to establish what an equivalent residential unit would be for our sewer system, which turns out to be 27 plumbing fixture units. And that's just the, that's the average number that we've had in a single family residential home um, over, the, over the period that was covered in the flow, with the flow numbers that we have. I don't wanna get too wonky here. And I know there's a lot of things that I'm throwing out. So please ask me questions where this gets confusing. Um, so the good news is, is that as we go through this for a single family residential, the numbers end up being very, very similar. So if you look here, we're talking about a very minor difference in FY. So in our current fee schedule, it was 20 plumbing fixture units had a base charge of 2,410. And then there was an additional charge of about 30 bucks per plumbing fixture unit. And so you ended up with a charge of 22,613 dollars if you had 27 plumbing fixture units under the 2021 fee schedule under what is being proposed to you today which is which is the equivalent of its residential unit that same 27 plumbing fixture units comes in at 2616 so almost identical um, with that calculation but what this system does is it makes it so that there is no minimum threshold that that you hit and so since there's no minimum threshold it's just a fixed cost per plumbing fixture unit and so it ends up being $96.89 per plumbing fixture unit. And so the impact at the, at the average single family, as you see, is very, very minimal. It's almost identical. But where we really see a benefit, which I think helps play into our efforts toward a more affordable housing, is on the lower end. Because under the proposed scheme, if somebody only had 20 plumbing fixture units, so if you had a smaller single family residential, say you have you know, uh, two bedrooms and two bathrooms rather than four bedrooms and three bathrooms, then you end up with a lower general facility charge. 
which is something that as we went through this process, that this was some of the feedback that we got, especially from some of the multifamily units where they said, look, like I'm incurring an equivalent cost for the facilities charge for a studio apartment as I am for a three bedroom apartment. And so it makes it harder to have more affordable units. And so I'm just going to go through the impact of this. So, so I guess the long and short of it is once you kind of wrap your head around how we derive that equivalent residential unit and how that ties to the plumbing fixture unit, then it's a very simple equation because when somebody comes in, it's a matter of counting the plumbing fixture units and it's a fixed charge per plumbing fixture unit. So when you look at the apartments, this is this will this will give you a, a little bit better of idea of the impact that that has on multifamily. So under our current scheme, we had a we had a minimum of 15 plumbing fixture units. And so it didn't matter if you dropped under that, that you were going to pay the same. And so it was 1775 for that 15 plumbing fixture units. And then if it hit the 27 plumbing fixture units, then it was the 2123. So now the plumbing fixture units are the same. So one ERU is 2,616. But if you have that apartment that has the 15 plumbing fixture units, now instead of the 1775, it's actually 1453.20. And so you start to see that impact on that where you have the smaller units that don't have four bathrooms and a laundry room and you know some of those larger facilities. Here's the last comparison that I'll throw up there just so you can kind of see what the impacts are. Um, the commercial general facility charges, so a commercial building, um, and you, you you get the gist of how we structured this now. So 15 plumbing fixture units, the 27 plumbing fixture units, that's where it would have hit. Currently now it would be 15 plumbing fixture units. It's a far lower amount, 27 plumbing fixture units. And so the nice thing is, is like our goal is to always introduce equity in the system. We want people to actually be paying for what they're contributing to the system. So by eliminating these minimums and just having a per plumber plumbing fixture unit that is tied to the equivalent residential unit, we can have a system that that truly reflects the impact of of plumbing fixtures on the system and that capacity requirement of the system um, and and benefits, especially those who have lower plumbing fixture units, which are often some of our more affordable housing units. So with that, I'd be happy to try and fill any questions you might have. Thank you, Tyler. Any questions? So this applies to new construction. That's right. Okay. This is new construction. This is new construction buying their capacity in the system. Yeah. So is this proposed to actually just go through and count the units of plumbing, you know, two for a washer, one for a sink and so forth? Yes, and that, that was already being done. What it removes is that minimum threshold so that if you have that studio apartment that only had 10 plumbing fixture units, it's no longer charged that minimum threshold 15. It just is charged for the actual plumbing fixture units that are within the apartment. Great. That was my question as well. I have, but I have a few others. I'm curious how this applies to something like an ADU. If you build one, do you already have a sewer hookup? So this is not applicable? With the accessory dwelling unit, it would just be the additional plumbing fixture units that would be applied. Gotcha. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anything from you, Gina? No, ma'am. All right. Then I think that's it. And I, how do you all feel about regular agenda versus consent? Just because it is a change in fees. Yeah, please. You'll be reviewing it uh, not only <clears throat> as the proposal that's before you today, but it also comes up in the fee resolution. So yep. it depends how you want to do it. We'll talk about it here in a few moments if that's going to impact your decision on where you want Can it. we table that then until the last item certainly can great thank you so much yep. yeah because that was going to be my next question was the fee resolution layout and that brings us to our last item fiscal year 2022 fee resolution changes okay thank you very much uh well you just heard the biggest one and tyler's exactly right uh, there was a lawsuit in the city of hayden north idaho building contractors versus uh, city of hayden that brought their general facilities charges into question uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, I think was reconsidered once and uh, came out with a formula on how to do this. And as Tyler indicated, even though uh, the way that we were charging it wasn't exactly what the court had uh, directed by applying the court's uh, formula that what we were charging was well within uh, what we would have been allowed if we'd been doing it that way. So that was a pretty good result. And as you can see from his presentation, uh, there will be some good benefits for affordable housing, so on and so forth. And bringing us clearly into compliance with the court's order is always a good thing. Uh, so we went through uh, the fee resolution. And as you know, this just became effective as of October 1st. Uh, the general rule with, with fees that we charge for services are that 
Uh, the cost of the service has to be reasonably related to the benefit of the service to the person paying the charge. Um, and there are some corrections as well. One of them was uh, the commercial account for a 1.5 inch water meter was just not adjusted. So that brings it into line with the other uh, fee resolution, so on and so forth. We talked about general facilities charges and then the magenta fee or parking permit, which you, some of you who've been around long enough have probably seen that. It disappeared off our fee resolution uh, probably four or five years ago. It is a, and the only people who get magenta uh, park in the magenta lot, it's over by West Park School. So we have an agreement, a standing agreement with Moscow School District so that being so close to the University of Idaho, we sell permits to the faculty and staff of the Moscow School District so they can park outside of West Park School. As I indicated, for some reason, probably because we weren't, it was done pursuant to a contract anymore. The school district mails us a check once a year, and um, for some reason it fell off. So we needed to put that back on. Uh, they've already paid the bill, so it's uh, <laughs> nothing's going to really change. Uh, so that, and then we had a sanitation tipping fee. There was a... Um, Calculation is on page 24 of 26 uh, for extra service for dumpster mechanical containers. It says a fee for each dump plus a $2 tipping fee in two places. There is no $2 tipping fee. That was just a, um, a mistake in it should have had a dash there instead of the tipping fee because um, the tipping fee actually is defined over on the next page. Uh, tipping fee, transportation tipping fee, inert demolition tipping fee, and mixed materials tipping fee. All the tipping fee is is what it costs to uh, tip or deliver a ton of any of these different types of waste to uh, the uh, solid waste processing facility east of town. Uh, the service charge is a volume service charge that you see for mechanical containers. It isn't tied to the tonnage of materials coming out of the containers. So we thought it best just to go ahead and clean up that language, add tipping fee, the definition in with those three types of waste, and then correct that uh, $2 mistake. Uh, I was also informed with the city clerk who's out attending some of the, uh, some of the seminars that uh, we were all at today. Uh, there were some um, just uh, grammatical changes that the city attorney's office had uh, that did not get incorporated in this draft. So uh, we will, I'll meet with Mia, we'll get those back in and it'll be coming to you. There needs to be a public hearing on this. Uh, Idaho law uh, requires that if you have a new fee or a fee that's increasing by more than 5%, then you have to have a public hearing. Since the, the magenta fee fell off, now it's being re-implemented. It is, quote, unquote, a new fee that was not contemplated when the current fee resolution was passed. So uh, we will be noticing this up for a public hearing for the uh, December 6th meeting. Um, of course, it presupposes that council agrees to implement the new uh, GFC charges. Can you remind me what our legal obligations are for public hearing notice? It's one week. Uh, it's different. If it's under the Local Land Use Planning Act, there are certain requirements. Uh, the only requirement in for this sort of, of notice is that it needs to be published in the newspaper of general circulation in our city, uh, which would be Moscow Pullman Daily News twice, uh, no more than seven days apart, I believe. So it'll come out. Lori will send out the notice probably tomorrow for publication on Wednesday. Then it'll go out again uh, next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gary. Any questions from the committee? Uh, just on the magenta fee, that's for school personnel only. Doesn't go to anybody outside? The no. But I know that uh, Bill and Transportation Commission were looking at maybe some recommendations because of the new pickleball courts that are in that same area. But as of to date, I don't know that any change is contemplated. So even though the magenta fee was there prior to four years ago or whatever, it's considered a new fee now? It's, all, it's always been our practice that if there is any question about it, you have the public hearing in, in the face yeah. of transparency and then um, 
there's no issue with it. Okay. Well, I agree with that. I just was trying yeah. to understand it myself. So, okay. And on the fee resolution for the uh, general facilities charge, is the uh, little item listed there, the 27 PFUs equal equivalent residential unit just there for clarification? Yes, it's a definitional. Okay. We wanted people to be able to come in. If you have an average home, as Tyler indicated, you can expect that your GFC is going to be that amount. But if you can prove that it's something else, that's why you have those individual, just like we do with the uh, stormwater fee. Gotcha. Thank you. Great. Anything else? Perfect. So I'm just thinking about how we want to structure this in terms of items number four and five on consent or on regular. Do you have any recommendation or preference? Uh, it would seem to me that if you want to get the word out, probably to have the GFC discussion before the fee resolution and have it on regular agenda. We don't have a terrifically crowded agenda on the six. So certainly we could have, uh, we could put it on regular and have plenty of time to get a full discussion. Great. Out. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. We have at least one staff report today, the fleet annual report. Uh, if I may, just since we aren't putting it on consent, is the uh, desire of the committee to recommend uh, approval of the GFC? Yes. Yes. Hello. Hey, we're back. Happy to be back here today, and I've got with me uh, Carl Reidinger, and Carl is our fleet supervisor, and we're here to give the annual fleet department report to the council. Um, it's uh, it, fleet's such a such an interesting department. We're it's one of those where Moscow is is at a size where it requires us to do everything, but we don't have a ton of funds or flexibility to uh, to do those things, and so it's one, one of the most interesting places to grapple with our size versus the the um, expected level of service in a community like Moscow is fleet. Because, for example, we we have to have one of everything that any big city has. And so Carl and his, his staff deal with the same ladder truck, the same jet truck, the same sweepers, the same plow trucks, the same engines, all of the same things that any major metro fleet department has to deal with but they have very limited people, limited resources. And so while, you know, you've got a city like Seattle or, or you know, even, even just a larger city like Boise who will have the ability and the luxury of having fleet people that just work on police cars or just work on lawnmowers, Carl has a staff of two technicians and himself that have to be able to do everything. And, and so it's, it's really a pretty, pretty impressive the way that they're able to run the fleet. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that they've done. Uh, you know, we've we've made a lot of progress in a lot of areas. Our low use review is is the envy of the region. It's something that people have looked to, and Carl will go into a little bit more detail about that. Our alternate fuel transition plan has been very aggressive from the get go. We've had an eco driver program that's helped us with fuel reductions now for over ten years. Um, and this year, Carl actually launched a fleet co op similar to our street co op that I believe you're all familiar with, where he's called together the fleet managers from a lot of different entities and had his initial meeting this year and hosted that sharing ideas, specifications, and really trying to do those economies of scale thing. And, and really just furthering our goal to always have Moscow be an example. We want to be, we want to be that place that people point to and say, you know, who's doing it right. They're doing it right. And Carl and his department are a great example of that. So I'll let Carl dive in and let you guys know what they've been up to. Okay. Uh, we'll start with uh, the first slide is our team there at fleet. Uh, starting on the left would be uh, Patrick Dollinger. He is the newest addition to Fleet, uh, almost three years now already. Uh, his background, he went to a two-year course at LCSC for uh, automotive and diesel. And he brings 12 years of experience from St. John here in town. So his, uh, his definite expertise would be hydraulics and heavy equipment. Uh, next in line is Mikey. Um, he has been here for almost 15 years. Uh, he came from 22 years at Ford. So his expertise is definitely uh, light duty repair. He's very, very good at it. And he's also an extremely talented fabricator as uh, many people know in the city. And then myself, uh, I went to school in Laramie. Uh, I went for associated uh, associates in um, applied service management over there. And then I've been to a few schools 
I'm also a construction mechanic for the Navy for 14 years now. And then Tammy, she started for the city in 03 and came to fleet in 13. She handles uh, the administrative side of um, invoices, all of our work orders that we do every single day. She is a whiz at the CFA program that we have. Uh, she keeps that up to date every single day. And she also keeps records on um, like our fuel island, what DEQ requires of us and the petroleum tank fund, what they require of us. And she does a very good job of that as well. So that'll go on to the next slide. Uh, this is probably the biggest part of fleet is preventative maintenance as many would guess. Um, we have a very, very wide range of vehicles that we do preventative maintenance on. Uh, we have about 240 pieces of equipment and that does include trailers. Uh, that includes the 14 generators in the city that we have kind of dispersed out. And uh, that does include snow blowers, uh, mowers, that type of thing. Uh, so some smaller equipment in there and attachments as well. And we also have service agreements with the ambulance company that operates here in town and the rural fire department. We do a lot of work with both of those entities. We do a lot of uh, pre-service checks and stuff for the rural prior to fire season, pumping and foam and stuff. And we also do uh, all of our tires in-house in our third bay uh, up to what I would say probably medium duty tires. So dualies enough, we don't do in-house. We don't have a big enough tire machine, but we stock tires for the police cars and stuff so they can just whip out there. We can put tires on if need be or, or fix a flat or something like that. Uh, we do the fuel island maintenance, fuel ordering. Uh, we kind of watch as far as the generators go, they're all diesel. So we ensure we have winterized fuel in all those generators going into winter and as well as our big diesel tank that's underground out at the city shop. We make sure we winterize that yearly as well. Um, go on to the vehicle fitting. This is probably the second biggest part of fleet. Uh, we do every, every new vehicle that comes to the city. Uh, it has some sort of upfit, whether that be a pickup that does radio fire extinguisher, first aid, and some kind of Amber safety strobe of, of something. Uh, our larger upfits are what's pictured up there. The police upfits. That's a, that's a pretty good task for our department. We, uh, take a lot of pride in the upfit process that we do here. There's not a lot of municipalities, our size that do their own upfits. Um, but we can do them in house and we do a pretty high quality. We try to really, really, uh, keep in mind that we're the ones that's going to see that vehicle for the next eight years uh, in the in the instance of a cop car. Uh, the fire command vehicles, we do those as well. And the uh, EMS Tahoes, uh, if you see those run around town, they're the white and the blue striped ones. Um, this is an area that we've always been really impressed and I've just been blown away by the work that our staff does. And our, our emergency service responders have been so happy to have our staff be able to do the build and understand how the builds are be because of our geographic isolation. It could be something where we don't want to have to have four extra cop cars. We can't afford to have four extra fire vehicles sitting around. And so having these guys locally have this expertise so that we're not having to ship something off to Spokane for some minor issue. And it sits up there for three weeks while we wait to get in and get a gap for a repair. Um, it's really rare, as Carl said, for a shop our size to do the full up build, uh, the upfitting on these, but it's, it's really paid dividends for the city of Moscow. Not only does it save us cost, but it allows us that flexibility so that we can keep those vehicles on the road and not have to sit with a bunch of spares around just for those situations. And we definitely, every single year, we revamp the upfit process just a little bit. We try to make the wiring a little bit better and try to make it, you know, uh, more durable throughout the years and that type of thing. There's a Sencom box in there. There's a middle one right there. That right there is what actually allows us to program the police vehicles and, and the fire command vehicles. That's what gives us our uh, our lights and our, our series of lights and that kind of, kind of thing. Uh, technician training. Uh, so we, we strive to try to keep up with 
you know, the new vehicles that come out every year and they're also different every single year. So uh, in the top left, there is the hybrid um, chassis that we have currently seven of. So we try to send our technicians to school to try to keep up on that. Uh, next week, Patrick will go to a uh, Watrous school, which all of us have gone through in fleet. And that is to certify us to work on the fire apparatuses, the pumps in them. And we, we mainly order Watrous pumps, uh, because they have the training for us. Uh, and then in January, all of us have the Ford hybrid, uh, operation diagnostics night class that we'll all go to, to try to help us with the new Ford police hybrids that we have and the fire department hybrid vehicles that we have. And then in March, uh, both technicians will go to a work truck show in the green truck summit, which it kind of has a lot of uh, industry trends. So they will bring in a lot of manufacturers and, you know, allow us to know where they're headed, uh, how we're going to fix their equipment or, you know, their, their maintenance projections for us in fleet. So. Uh, eco driver as tyler mentioned started in uh, 11 i think mm -hmm. 11 and it was every new employee goes through eco driver training it was uh, implemented to help remind people that you know cut down on idling and and do ride sharing that type of thing uh, to and from job sites instead of taking six vehicles people pile in a vehicle that type of thing uh, some carpooling how to you know, drive around town, hard stopping and hard, hard accelerating that type of thing. So that's uh, really helped fleet talk to every single one of our internal customers uh, on an individual basis and understand a little bit of where, you know, what we're coming from, what we do and our kind of policies that we have uh, for them to operate our vehicles. One of the interesting things with EcoDrivers, you'll see on this chart, we had this pretty precipitous drop and then we kind of started trending back up a little bit here. Um, it really is kind of indicative of, of how well the program has worked because from, from this point here to our low point here, we added vehicles to the fleet. The fleet wasn't shrinking. Our efficiency was just getting better. And that was largely due to the initial parts of the program. There was a lot of low hanging fruit. You know, we were able to, we combined use on a lot of vehicles. We had a lot of, of benefits from the staff training that we went through. We got rid of certain vehicles. Um, and then we were able to make, just buy more efficient vehicles. Um, and then what we've seen is, uh, cause we were increasing at about 4% annually. So we actually saw a decrease, um, but we continue to grow as a city. And so we continue to have the fleet grow. Uh, parks was a big impact. We've had a lot of parks property come on and that requires more mowers. Um, Calvin's done a great job with the parks department. So they're more efficient and the level of service has gone up in parks. And so this is just for us an indication of how, how really our focus now with the eco driver program in process, we've got the driver behavior. We have routine low use reviews that go out once every three years. All of those processes are in place to help us maintain really low use. And so now we really turn our focus to the alternate fuel transition plan because that's where we really can see the benefits. And Carl's gonna talk about some of the benefits that we're seeing there. And as we look to the future, which, which sectors we think are the next on the horizon for us to be able to engage in with that alternate fuel transition plan and continue to see a fuel decrease. So in our alternative, uh, alternative fuel transition plan, we, we've had pretty good success uh, only due to our departments. Uh, they've worked really, really well with us and every single department that's taken on the responsibility of driving a hybrid they are different than other vehicles uh the police have been great they've we've transitioned out uh, over half their marked unit units uh just in 21 so we have six new hybrid police vehicles that are in service as of september and then two more next year and we'll phase out the rest of them in the years after that the fire department also worked with us and we were able to transition from a crew cab pickup to a, a, a hybrid uh, explorer up in the top right and that is the ems division chief and we also have transitioned in a two evs the middle one there the red bolts uh, they have been fantastic everybody loves to drive them they're good rigs and then in the bottom right is the newest version of chevrolet's euv and not an ev it's this pretty much the same vehicle uh, that is going to be an addition 
additional fleet vehicle and that will go to uh, community development this year. And uh, so with the police vehicles being implemented this year, we're already seeing a 60% reduction in fuel use uh, in those vehicles versus the identi identical explorers years prior, the 15 and to 19. So it's quite, quite a bit of fuel savings just in those marked units, let alone the electric vehicles that don't use any fuel at all. Um, we were pretty excited when we started getting those numbers back because we, you know, we had, we had the projected numbers, but you know, you just, you just never know what it's actually going to look like. And since we have the ability with the work that Carl staff does, they very closely track how many miles the, the gallon, we know how, how far they're traveling, they get to do all the maintenance on these. And so when we, when we saw these numbers come back at 60%, that actually puts our payback time for the additional cost of going to the hybrid at just one year. And so at just one year, when we, when we actualize six years of savings at almost $4,000 per year, we're knocking off almost a third of the value of the, of the cost of the vehicle just in fuel savings. And so that was just, you know, if, if you take away the environmental impact entirely, just from a cost impact, that's huge. And as Carl mentioned, we really couldn't appreciate more the cooperation of the departments. You know, it's for, for police and fire, these emergency services, relying on their vehicles to get somewhere is critical and crucial and so there's an understanding trepidation about shifts to new things if they're not so if they're not sure about them and so their cooperation has been key in this you know and as you mentioned with the fire vehicle going from a crew cab pickup that was probably getting somewhere around with the way that those are running the fire department eight to maybe 10 mm -hmm. miles to the gallon to this vehicle here that's going to be an even bigger savings and so the fleet's just such a great example of of how not everything that we do as a city to try and be efficient is big and splashy. It's a lot of micro decisions over time that can have a really, really big impact. There's other technologies in the police hybrids that we immediately notice every year. Police does EVOC courses in Lewiston. That's the and, driving training courses mm -hmm. that the police do. So we send two cars down there every day. And in years past, without the hybrids, they do not have what's called regenerative braking. So they don't have the electric motor to assist in stopping. And that's a lot of what they do is hard acceleration, hard stop in those courses. And typically a car would go about two and a half days on a set of brakes. So we would do probably a set of brakes every two days. And then these hybrids here, by the end of the entire week, we weren't even close to one set. We never replaced them. So, so just, just those little savings. things, just other things that hopefully will impact fleet maintenance overall. And then uh, also, we've identified quite a few vehicles, hopefully to transition into, whether it be hybrid or uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles or fully EVs. Uh, we're pretty excited. The storm department has a budget this year for FY22 to hopefully purchase our first fully electric pickup for the storm department. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, Ford will probably be the first one out. We haven't receive the fleet specs yet from them but hopefully uh hopefully next summer and then electric mowers there's a company in salt lake that is uh starting with commercial size mowers uh full eight to ten run hour times we're going to try to get some demos of those to help with the increased fuel use in parks so yeah it's, it's been very exciting because we've seen we've when we initially made the alternate fuel transition plan, we've had to revisit it annually. We, we'd anticipated revisiting it, but the technology has evolved so quickly and Carl and his staff do a really great job staying on top of it. We have to be careful because we don't have the luxury to take a flyer on something that isn't going to work. So we really have to, we, we, do, we can't be the guinea pig right out the gate. We've got to get some data. We've got to be able to do some demos and make sure it's going to work for us. But we're, we've also tried to be as aggressive as we can be. But yeah, things like electric mowers, um, electric motorcycle for the police motorcycle, those are on the closer term horizon. And the electric mowers in particular will have a very large impact. Those coupled with the police, the police uh, patrol fleet will, are our two biggest fuel users. And so that's that's really exciting to see those start to become alternatives. Um, we've also got a grant that we're putting in for our first electric loader, which is the small loader that's out at the water reclamation facility. Um, there's, there's a grant through the Volkswagen funds that's available for that type of transition. And so that may be our first fully electric piece of larger equipment. And so it's, it's really evolved quickly and Carl and his staff have done a great job staying on top of it. With that, we'd be happy to field any questions y'all might have about fleet. Well, first, uh, 
I'm outraged because your presentation was so good. You nixed most of the questions I was getting ready to have. Good. I'm just disappointed. But in downstream consequences, uh, as we get more and more electric vehicles and equipment, what does that mean for charging stations? Or is it sufficient on some of these lighter uses to plug them in overnight or weekend and catch up? that way what do we have planned i'll touch on it more peripherally and carl can go into more depth on the plan um so to answer your question a lot of the city activities really lend themselves well to lower level overnight charging so when you think about a lot of the activities we have most of the city activities you think uh building inspectors for example they go out during the day they go from site to site to site we're a relatively small geographic city so you're not driving 200 miles in a day you're maybe driving 30 miles in a day at the most um, and it's a lot of just out and back, which is just perfect for electric vehicle use. And then they can charge overnight. And so as long as we have that charging infrastructure, which is relatively cheap charging infrastructure, they're able to sit on a charger overnight. They've got a full charge the next day and away they go. Uh, for example, the, the electric vehicle that I drive is a fully electric, one of the bolts. And I end up charging that vehicle to a full charge about every other week, one time every other week. Um, because of the nature of the trips are just so quick and around town and so it's really conducive to it that way as we get into some of the larger equipment we'll certainly have to upgrade some of that charging and that's something that carl can touch on is just that longer term charging plan uh, we have in this year's budget uh monies to the priority right now is because the water department is redoing their electrical panel in that machine shed down there i will try to do ev charging reels in there and that will kind of suffice for one charger per two bay down there and that would probably alleviate a lot of future charging needs in that building for quite a while there will hopefully be one installed in building b which would be the storm vehicle uh, all these being level two which is the equivalent of running probably a dryer it's still a 30 amp two pole circuit so we have one at the water department currently one will be installed uh bill belk map is working um, with grop to install one at the fifth street building that's that they're moving into to do that car at the bottom right the euv and there's one at the wharf as well for the electric vehicle that was out there and then we've, we've generated a plan prioritizing the different city facilities and initiated work with the vista to look at the availability of power so that we can add and then um so that we can add the initial charging and then make sure that that's expandable to accommodate the future charging that'll be necessary Anything from you, Gina? No. Thank you so much. I have such a deep appreciation for the work that your team does too. I, I had a couple. So do the hybrids still have combustion engines as Correct. well? So they have that and a battery. Correct. Um, so what, what does it look like to maintain hybrids or uh, strictly electric vehicles? Like I'm wondering as far as your team goes the long in the long term, is that something that we're going to be able to do in house as well? So there's training to work on the higher voltage systems. Uh, luckily, Mikey, our, one of our techs that came from Ford, uh, Ford came out with a lot of hybrids in the early 2000s, a lot of escapes. So he has a lot of training on those hybrid vehicles. Uh, this, the training that we have in January will hopefully kick that off in order to deal with like the police hybrids and that type of thing. Great. I did. Uh, one of the reasons why we went with the Ford hybrid is we keep those police vehicles somewhere around seven to eight years and their warranty on the hybrid system is eight year 100,000. So it's just kind of right at that mark. And then same with the bolts. Uh, we bought those on a 10 to 12 year cycle, uh, being that the warranty is 10 years. Great. One, one of the, our real hopes and too, is that, um, that the, the initial numbers that we're seeing come back and that are pretty consistent with numbers nationwide is that the electric vehicles just take less maintenance. There's mm -hmm. less moving parts. Um, and so as we transition to more electric vehicles, one of the things that it will help us do for, for years, as Gary can attest to, we had requests from the fleet supervisor for additional technician help mm -hmm. because the fleet has grown pretty significantly since we last hired a technician. So you know, we've got two technicians and a supervisor trying to maintain 220 units. I know that sometimes it feels like my own car maintaining it's a damn near a part-time job. So uh, I can't imagine having that big a fleet with, with three people. But I, it will really help us fend off having to hire more staff to maintain them because we'll be able to maintain a larger quantity with the staff that we have due to that less intensive maintenance. Does it depend on the vehicle, this, the answer to this question? But if something does go wrong, where do we send it? It totally depends on the vehicle. Yeah. And so, so you know, if it's, if it's Ford or Chev, our dealerships locally are, are training up technicians. So if it's not something that we can do in-house, we can generally farm that out. 
um, some of the larger vehicles. It'll just depend on where they're where they're maintained out of. A lot of them are in the Spokane area for us. Mm -hmm. um, some even out in the Tri Cities, and so that's that's something we always have to take into account, even with traditional engines. Um, is is what does maintenance and service look like for us, and what's parts availability look like for us? Because we are a little bit isolated, and most of this is critical equipment that we only have one of. Um, we can't afford to have it down for long periods of time. So that is something we always have to take into account as we specify vehicles. Thank you for the info and the great presentation. So oh, is the Berminator ready to go? She's all geared up and ready to roll, Art. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I feel like I don't want to be cursed that it's already, we're thinking about that so soon, but I know it's time. Um, do we have any other staff reports, Gary? Nothing further, ma'am. Perfect. Then I think we are good to adjourn. Indeed. Yes.